This presentation of Law Day was sponsored by the Florida Association for Women Lawyers of Martin County and the Martin County Bar Association. Good afternoon. Welcome to Law Day 2016. I am Attorney Barbara Cook. And this panel discussion is being brought to you by the Florida Bar Association as well as the Florida Association for Women Attorneys. We have today, uh, it's going to be a panel discussion and to the purpose of the panel discussion is to hopefully uh, get young people to understand what their rights are under the law before they become uh, adults. And maybe us older folks will also learn something from this today. So as our panelists we have here uh, three, uh, a gentleman and a lady, fr attorneys and uh, people representing the Sheriff's Office. Would you like to introduce yourselves? My name is Jerome Stone with the law firm of Stone and Capobianco. We're located in downtown Stewart. And I'm Detective Sergeant Jesse Carday with the Martin County Sheriff's Office. My name is Marcus Johnson. I'm an assistant state attorney with the state attorney's office in the 19th Circuit. Welcome today. Uh, and, and on my right here, we have three of our students who are students from Jensen Beach High School. And uh, their ages are 15, 16, and 17, so soon to be adults. And I have uh, the gentleman here is Elijah. Next to him is Jay Ray. And on the end is Mitch Dida. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming today. We're gonna, what we're gonna, how this uh, panel discussion is going to run is we're gonna, I'm going to ask the uh, young people uh, individually what kind of questions they might have for either law enforcement or a criminal defense attorney or a prosecutor from the prosecutor state attorney's office. So well, I'm going to start off with Elijah. Elijah, do you have a, a question for the panelists? Could you come up to the uh, microphone there? Um, good evening. Um, it's mainly directed towards police officers and like adults. Um, how do you police feel as they are approaching a stopped vehicle or a group of people? I could tell you from being in the field for 13 years, and I think I could speak for most officers out there, the first thing we're thinking as we're walking up to a group of individuals or vehicles is a person armed. How many people am I about to encounter? I'm watching folks' hands, I'm looking for, again, any, and by armed, I mean with a firearm pocket knife, something as simple as that. So that's the first thing that goes through my mind, my safety and the safety of others around me. Thank you. Thank you. So what would, what would you recommend to uh, a young person who for the first time in his life is, is being approached by a police officer and um, what would you advise that individual to do? Um, I have teenagers of myself, myself and I tell them, uh, you know, obviously if you're approached by an officer, just comply, follow directions. Um, they're, they're just like your parents or you know, grandmas, you know, uncles, brothers. They're people too. Um, so obviously just respect. Um, you know, don't, don't make any abrasive moves. Uh, don't run away when they're trying to speak to you. Um, but just uh, boils down to respect and just, just comply. If someone tells you, to, hey, come, come talk to me for a second, just Give a minute out of respect and stop and speak to them, but don't make any abrasive moves. If they ask you to keep your hands out your pockets, you know, just just listen, comply. W would the police officer normally uh, immediately advise the people in the car to keep your hands in sight or anything like that? Absolutely, because we don't know who's in the car. Um, you don't know what's in the vehicle as well. So, yes, absolutely, just keep your hands where it's visible. Don't make any abrasive moves because you know the officer might take it as an you know something. Being, being done out of aggression. You know, are you hiding something? Are you trying to reach for a firearm? Again, like I said, first impression is, you know, are they trying to hide a firearm or grab a firearm? That's so so the then first. you would recommend that all the occupants in the car keep their hands where they're visible? Absolutely. And don't move them? Absolutely. Okay. You know, if I could comment on, on that, one of the other things that I think is important, especially living here in Florida, we have a lot of cars that have tinted windows. If you're the driver of that window, as the officer pulls you over, I think it's a good idea to roll down your window. It allows the officer to have an unobstructed view into your, your car and it starts to lower the officer's suspicion or concern about um, the, the individuals in the car because you're, you're clearly making it visible 
to the officer as he approaches. Absolutely. Jesse, so you agree I, with I, that? Absolutely agree. And yeah. right. I'd like to add something to that also. I think it's important to understand that law enforcement do not know who they're coming into contact with. Um, essentially, they're approaching strangers, and safety is obviously the main issue, not only for their safety, but the safeties of um, others around them. But a law enforcement officer, when they make contact with someone, doesn't know what's going on in the interior of the vehicle. They can't, they don't have x-ray vision. They can't see what's on the floor or in the armrest or in your hand. So it's important to, you know, make those, make your hands visible. And I know that a lot of people do things out of nervousness. They may put their hands in their pocket or next to their face and things of that nature. But I think it's important to recognize that, hey, I'm making contact with a law enforcement officer. You know, let's see what's going on and make sure that you're not doing anything that would hide uh, your hands or things of that nature. So let's say that there's a car with uh, five young adults in it. And a lot of times young adults are kind of noisy and, and, and don't like to sit and be quiet. And, and the poor driver there is the one that's obviously at risk, mostly. So how, how could you recommend to the driving adult or the driver uh, how to control his passengers? I, I think most people, when you, whether you've committed a crime or you've done anything wrong, when the police officers stop you, we all get nervous. Adults do it. And, and you would suspect that young children, young kids would do it as well. Um, so naturally, you should be a little nervous. We all get nervous. But for the driver, rolling down the window, putting your hands on the steering wheel, don't reach for your driver's license, don't reach for your registration. Get it when the officer tells you to get it and tell him that you're getting it. If it's in the glove compartment, if it's in the center console, that's what you're doing. And ask, simply ask your other friends, hey, everybody be quiet, just sit and wait and see what the officer wants. Right, very good. You may also want to turn the radio down because if a law ah. enforcement officer is giving you direction and you, you can't hear him, he's not, he may not understand it's not because you can't hear him, you just may not be following direction. So if you turn the radio down, especially if you have four or five other people in the vehicle, it gives you an opportunity to to be heard essentially by law enforcement so they can see what's going on and then you can obviously hear what they're saying. Right. And so if they're asking you to do something in particular, you can respond to that. And then the people in the car also can re recognize what's going on so they're not still jumping around and singing the song when the officer is coming up to the vehicle to make a traffic stop or something of that nature. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's proceed to the next question. Mitch Nida, have you got a question for our panel? Um. Um, what if we don't want the police to touch us or search our car? What if we say no and they still do it? it it's my recommendation if the police officer asks to search your car that you say no. I prefer that you don't search my car. Unless you've committed a crime um, or there's some suspicion, there's no reason for the officer to search your car. And you can decline to give him that opportunity. Now, was, I'm oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was saying if the officer has probable cause to search your vehicle, that at that point you no longer have the option. And so you can ask them, you know, what's your probable cause? Why are you searching my vehicle? Obviously do it, again, in a respectful manner. Um, and they'll, they'll explain to you what's going on, but um, you can ask them why. And, but if you don't want them to, you just say, I, I don't want you to search my car. Well, it, it, if they've already been stopped, wouldn't, they have, wouldn't there be probable cause right there? There'd be probable cause for the stop, but if there was another, you know, like Kit mentioned before, if there was a crime that had been committed and that vehicle's a suspect, that's a suspect vehicle in that crime, then they may have, you know, further probable cause to search the vehicle. But just because a vehicle stopped, that alone doesn't give them right to search the vehicle. Right. There has to be other, another more probable cause to get inside your vehicle. And, and that's correct. And, um, so, and there's another part to that. And just because you tell an officer, you, an officer may ask, may I search your vehicle? And your response could be, no, you cannot search my vehicle. That's not the end all be all. Because as um, my co-panelists have indicated, the officer may have additional probable cause absent your consent. So you may say no, but they could still go ahead and search your vehicle if they've concluded that there's probable cause to make a search. Um, for instance, if an officer stops a vehicle for a, a, tail, a headlight being out or a taillight being out or something to that extent, and they make contact with the driver and there's an odor of cannabis emanating from the vehicle. 
Now, that, at that point, depending on the circumstances, the officer may have probable cause to search your vehicle to try to locate that suspect cannabis. Now, you may object and say, I don't want you searching my vehicle, but that's not the end of that if the officer has probable cause. So again, it's the importance, it goes back to respectfulness. Uh, so you can respectfully decline and they could search anyway. If they continue to search, the response should not be, well, I told you not to search my vehicle, and now you become aggressive, because that could definitely change the dynamic of the encounter. So listening and following direction and being respectful will assist you in that type of scenario. And, and everyone should understand that being stopped for a traffic infraction, whether it's speeding, running a stop sign, having a broken taillight, is not probable cause for searching the vehicle. That is a civil infraction for which you do not have to give consent. Uh, as they're mentioning, a, if it's cannabis or marijuana, then that's a criminal violation which may give the officer a reason to search. But a simple traffic infraction, speeding, running the stop sign, weaving um, as you're driving down the road, that in and of itself, if that's the basis for the stop, does not give them permission to search. So if there's no probable cause, and, and if, if the driver feels that there's nothing that, uh, that he wants to hide, why would he not want to allow the search anyway? It, it may seem reasonable that if you have nothing to hide that I will just let them search my vehicle, but it's your right to say no. Um, and oftentimes the you know, police officers will say that, well, if you have nothing to hide, why can't I search your vehicle? It's your right to say no. And they may ask you repeatedly. And if they ask you two or three times or more, you still have the right to say no each and every time. And, and I've also heard that a good reason for not having a search, especially when you've had friends in a car, is uh, what if the friend had some cannabis on him or some other controlled substance and puts it under the seat and then he gets out of the car and all of a sudden your car has a, has a uh, banned substance in it, which could be a problem for you. Thank you very much. I think she had another question. Mitch Nida. Um, I have one more question. Um, what if we, what if the officer asks to touch us, like to search our body? Mm. What about that? Can we still say no? They can pat you down for safety. And by pat down, it's just to make sure you don't have any weapons on you. And that's just a quick, a quick pat down. Um, the search would be a more invasive, you know, searching of the pockets. Um, you know, asking you to search, you know, in your shoes. Um, but you can still, you can say no to a search, but a pat down is for our safety to make sure that you are not armed. Thank you. And if you, being a female, you can request if there is a female deputy, a female that can do the search as well. If there's one available, they would provide one for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Elijah, have you got another question? Or did I, did I miss uh, Jay Ray? Jay Ray, would you like to ask a question? If I'm with a group of people that have done, or in a car, and they have done something illegal, is it also that I could be in trouble for what they have done because I am with them? Well, it, it depends on what they've done. If you're in the vehicle and a group of people have gone in and they've robbed a grocery store or a, a convenience store and they get in the, and everyone's in the car driving away, you could be held responsible. Um, not as the principal person who went in and robbed, but somewhat, someone who was involved because you're in the car with them at that time. If it's something that it relates to, they have alcohol or drugs in the car uh, and you don't have any of the alcohol or drugs, um, hopefully, most of our law enforcement officers in this area are pretty smart. They can identify whether it's the individual who's responsible for the drugs or marijuana or um, alcohol, or if it's going to be charged to the group as a whole. And I think, going off of what he said also, you want to make sure, I mean, obviously, you want to make sure your friends getting in your car don't have anything. I know when I was a kid, my, I, my Basic speech was, nobody has anything on them. I don't want to get in trouble. Mm. You know, you definitely want to pick, choose your friends wisely. And because, uh, again, and a, a scenario that was mentioned earlier, if somebody has marijuana in your car and they throw it, you know, what if they put it by your seat? It makes it, it, it appears as if it's yours when the uh, search of the car is done. 
or there, we have also what's called constructive possession. Everyone in the vehicle can be charged for that little bit of marijuana. There could be four people in the car, and one person had it and ditched it. Now everybody gets in trouble. So obviously, it's, you want to make sure your friends don't have anything on them when they get in your car. And I would say you also not only make sure that they don't have anything on them, but if you later find out that they have something on them, you shouldn't try to do anything that's going to aid or assist them in hiding it. Because if law enforcement is there to conduct an investigation in regards to that, you know it's there, law enforcement knows it's there, and, and they're investigating it. Allow them that opportunity. Don't do anything to interfere with that, because by interfering with it, or let's say you try to slide it under your foot or hide it from law enforcement, you can, uh, you're showing that you may be involved in it and that may count against you. So you would definitely not want to do anything that would you know, further have law enforcement suspect that you are involved as well. Thank you. Well, we've talked about uh, having uh, drugs and uh, pot in possession. We've talked about uh, traffic infractions. Uh, what other type of incidents do young adults get involved in that, that can cause them trouble in, the, in a vehicle? Well, one of the things that we see very often, and we're in my office, we defend young people on, is driving without a valid license. It's a easy thing to do. You get, you take your parents' car, or you take the car of another friend who may have a license, and yet you're driving the car. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very easy for young people to get behind the wheel and drive when you shouldn't be driving. If you don't have a license, you shouldn't be operating a car. Uh, makes it uh, makes a dangerous situation for everyone. And how about uh, if they're driving someone else's car and someone else doesn't have insurance on that car? Are, is the driver liable? The driver potentially can be liable. If you were involved in an accident and you injure someone, you could be liable. You, and you, the consequences can be great for you as a young person because you can lose your license, um, you lose your ability to drive, uh, and it can go against you in the future in terms mm -hmm. of um, when you're getting a car, your insurance rates going up and things like that that you have to be concerned about. You also want to be careful with regards to um, driving with uh, suspended licenses, driving without valid licenses, uh, because that isn't a strictly juvenile offense. It's a criminal citation. And we see juveniles entering into the uh, county court, which is the, the criminal system, with those types of uh, citations. So I know, I know a lot of children think, well, you know, if I go out joyriding or I drive my parents' car without, without a license, that that may not be such a bad thing, but it does have criminal consequences for persons under the age of 18. And those persons can find themselves mm -hmm. in the criminal justice system in county court because the law does not make that distinction as a juvenile offense. They would come into the criminal county court with other um, defendants who have other criminal misdemeanor types of charges pending. So. Driving as a 16-year-old or 15-year-old without a valid driver's license will end you up, will have you in the, uh, the criminal justice system in county court. What, what are some of the reasons that a young adult might have a license suspended and not even know it? Traffic citations, not paying them. Um, that's a surefire way to have your license suspended. We see, uh, and that's, that can be a really difficult hole to dig yourself out of. Because uh, you know, once your license is suspended for, let's say, a, a, a speeding ticket that you failed to pay, um, there will be fines and things like that associated with reinstating your license. So essentially, if you don't cure the problem when it's time to be cured at the time that you get the speeding ticket, then you could potentially find yourself in a financial hole and not being able to dig yourself out because you've got so many fees to pay because of uh, all the things that you may have ignored or not paid attention to. And, and I've also heard that some other reasons for having a license suspended are failure to pay child support. It may not apply to very young adults, but as they get a little bit older, that could happen too. Yeah. That's, that's correct. correct. And yeah. driving a car that's uninsured it leads to, can lead to suspension of the license without yes. them even knowing it. That's correct. It, well, when you're dealing with those two situations, it's very important from the adult standpoint because you're not going to have, you sh we shouldn't be having children having license suspended for non-payment of child support. But if it happens to an adult, you receive notice from Florida Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, you should take that notice and make sure that, one, you pay, catch up on your child support, and then you pay the reinstatement fee. It's the failure to pay the reinstatement fee that not many mm. times will get people uh, in trouble. Um, the other thing about not having insurance, your F uh, SR-22, um, that can, for our financial responsibility, that can also suspend your license. There again, 
even if you go out and get new insurance, make sure you go and have your license reinstated. Right, okay. One of the things we've talked about is, and focused on is young people driving cars. But we have to remember that we have mopeds that are very popular, that depending upon the size of the moped, that you can't even drive a moped uh, without a, the proper license. So there, it's not just limited to the cars themselves. We have to worry about the mopeds. You, you, you see a lot of the mopeds that are motorized and they have pedals on them. There's a distinction between you know, which one requires a license and which one do not. So we have to be careful about that. And how about golf carts, ATVs, motorcycles? Motorcycles require um, uh, a special endorsement. Special you, endorsement, You have correct. to take the class to mm -hmm. get the motorcycle endorsement in order to, to drive the motorcycle. ATVs have to be street legal? They do. They should be street legal. Otherwise, you should not be driving them on the street. And the same thing with golf carts? Golf carts, golf carts are... They're a special kind of... And, and again, there's, there's a lot of different permutations as far as... Um, what qualifies as a vehicle and what does not. So obviously if you're going to be driving uh, a golf cart on a street, that's something that you would obviously have to have a license for um, because you're on a roadway and it's one of those things that would require a license. So um, you just want to, if you're going to drive anything on the on a roadway, just make sure you have a license for it or at least some type of driver's license. If you need a mo motorcycle endorsement, get your motorcycle endorsement. Um, you just don't want to, you know, drive things on a roadway without any type of licensing. And that would that'd be a safer bet. Yeah. Does, does not having a driver's license uh, prior to the age when they could have attained a driver's license impact the ability to get a driver's license when they do attain the correct age and, and have all the requirements met? Well, the DMV is its own separate entity and agency. Uh, I could sit here and tell you what I think may be the right thing to do uh, as far as the DMV goes, but uh, criminally, they, they, they're not bound by what we say or by even what mm. the judge says a lot of times. So if you have a question with regard to licensing um, and things of that nature, speaking directly to the DMV will be your best tool because they will tell you specifically what you need to do and when you need to do it. and criminally is, is what most of us are involved in. It's, we, they, they're their own separate entity and, and agency on their own. So uh, it's essentially what they say goes. So a criminal uh, charge and, and conviction will not affect getting a valid license at any future yes, point? Yes, it will. It, it actually, will. It, it can. does issue them a driver's license. If, they're, if they don't have a driver's license and you're caught driving without one and you're facing criminal charges, DMV does issue a Florida driver's license and it can impact. Um, you'll have hefty fines to pay to get that license reinstated. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Jay Ray, have you got any other questions you'd like to ask? Or shall we move on to uh, back to Elijah? We got another question? What do we do if we get stopped by the police so nothing bad will happen? Well, like I explained uh, before with my co-panelists, um, if you're stopped, obviously, and if the windows are tinted, first thing is, um, you know, put the windows down. Give the officer an opportunity to see how many people are in the car. Uh, keep your hands where the officer can see and tell your occupants as well. Keep their hands where they can be seen. Um, basically, respect and speak to them, you know, you know Speak to them respectfully and comply. Listen, listen to the directions. Thank you. The, the, the other important thing about that is when they're stopping someone, the worst thing you can do is not pull over immediately. If you don't have a safe place to pull over, you at least should put on your blinker so that they know you're looking for a place to stop and then pull over as quickly as you can. Because if you don't, it makes them nervous. <laughs> and when law enforcement officers get nervous, they carry guns. We don't like people who are nervous carrying guns and coming up to your car. So it's very important. Don't drive away or try to avoid the police. You're not going to get, get away. They have a radio. They can radio ahead, put other uh, cars out in front of you. So pulling over as soon as you can is also very important about that. 
Don't let your if any fear that you have about being stopped by law enforcement. Don't let that can dictate what you're what you are going to do, because again, when law enforcement is making contact with you, they're not sure of what's going on inside of the vehicle. They know that they're making a traffic stop or some other type of form of stop based on probable cause, and that's it. They don't know who's in the vehicle and what they're doing. So following direction is going to be your best friend. Follow direction is following direction is really the best. Uh, advice that I can give anyone co coming in in contact with law enforcement and you know obviously being able to hear them by having your music down and you know and things like that is also is also important but just follow direction it'll make the, the process go by a lot smoother and a lot quicker if you're respectful and you just do exactly what you're asked thank you thank you Mitch Knight I think you had a question about uh, fear of police and gangs uh, yes um how come people equally fear police as they do gangs? Why do you think we're so afraid of police? I think a lot of it has to do with social media and how we're portrayed out there. There's, um, we see a lot more negative uh, topics about law enforcement than we do positive. Um, people forget is that we're people too. Um, I have a child your age. And so it, it's hard for her to understand, you know, why law enforcement is treated that way, because she sees it as, that's my mom, why, why would they talk to her that way? Um, but I would invite you guys and a any of any students actually to want to come through the sheriff's office, meet deputies, come along, I invite you guys to come over. Mm. Okay, but I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, social media and everybody just getting out there and, uh, like I said, there's more, more negativity portrayed um, towards law enforcement. And you also don't want to let the actions of a few dictate the actions of many. And what that means is that just because there's a social, social media attention or uh, your traditional media attention with regard to how law enforcement is, are conducting themselves doesn't mean that every single law enforcement officer that you come into contact with is going to have that same type of mentality. So uh, just as though I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't know you and you don't know me, I would hope that, you know, you wouldn't assume that I'm going to, you know, want to do something ill will to you, um, all because you know I'm an assistant state attorney, um, and just like you know, in in life we've all had bad interaction with uh, people, and at the end of the day we're all people. But you can't hold, you can't categorize a group of people of being evil or bad all because of the actions of a few. So when you interact with a law enforcement officer, you should have the mental state to say, you know what, this is, a, this is a different interaction. This is new. This is a new person who I've never met before. Don't, do not assume that they're there to do something bad to you. Assume that they're there to do something, you know, that's not bad. You may not want to get a traffic ticket, but don't assume that the interaction is going to be really bad and, and you know, and, and fearful. Just start them a new slate and don't judge them for the things that you've seen in social media. Thank you. Mitch Knight, one, one more thing. I think you also had a question about what, what if uh, the police officer wants to arrest you or, or take you to the police station? Yes. Uh, what if a police officer wants to arrest me? And, like, can I say no? Because I know I didn't do anything wrong. Can I just, can I resist? I would highly advise you not resist. Um, obviously, the officer would explain to you what your charges are. Uh, but the, that's not the place to fight those charges. If you want, the, you know, you can explain to the officer what involvement you had or what involvement you didn't have. Uh, but the, that's the worst thing you want to do is resist, and, and it, it can become violent from there, and that's where we don't want it to go. Uh, so um, as we mentioned before, just follow directions, listen, and then you can find someone like Mr. Stone to represent <laughs> you. <laughs> and we, we have, I've seen it time and time again, someone is stopped they know they don't have a valid driver's license and they do pull over and then when the officer goes to arrest them they start to resist well you've just added a, a separate charge and it depends on how you resist if you re you can resist with violence or without violence the with violence is a felony the without violence is a misdemeanor so it's best to go to go ahead and, and cooperate with the officer for what he's arresting you for and avoid the additional charge it's, it's really easier to defend on that one charge than it would be to have multiple charges related to um, your refusal to cooperate. I think the natural tendency is to argue, I didn't do anything wrong, why are you arresting me? Would that be considered resisting? If you're, if you're, being, if you're solely being verbal, and that's what you're saying as you're being arrested, that may not exacerbate the situation, but it's, it's, it's when you start 
pulling and tensing. And I don't think a lot of people understand that that's resisting. If an officer goes to reach for you, your arm to place you under arrest and you tense up and you hold back, you're now impeding that arrest. And I think that a lot of times in social media, you hear people saying, well, he's not doing anything. He's not doing anything. Well, that, that tensing, that interruption of that arrest is doing something and that's resisting without violence. And the idea behind that is that when we don't want situations where the community and the police are at essentially an odds or in, in a very confrontational situation when someone's being arrested. If you're being arrested, you are to be arrested and transported to the jail on whatever charges that you're being arrested on. If you're gonna contest that, you need to contest that in the courtroom, um, in front of a judge, or in front of an, an assistant state attorney like myself, and we can address it there. Resisting an officer who is just doing their job on that day is not the way to go about it, and it just creates uh, what we have today uh, this this influx of uh, people recording law enforcement officers and trying to agitate them um, when they're making an arrest, uh, and you, you don't want to do something like that. Just you know, you may be upset about it, and because no one likes to be arrested, mm -hmm. but resisting uh, and pulling away and tensing or running or uh, becoming violent is not the way to to um, to go about it. Thank you. Elijah, perhaps one last question. You had something uh, to ask about video taping or, or taking, a, having your phone take it away? Yes. Um, are officers allowed to tell you to put your phone away or take your phone during a stop? I guess the answer is, that the, the, I guess we can all have our own spin on it, but I think the answer is it depends. Now, there's a difference between um, you also you got kind of actually you got to look at it in two ways. You know, if you're the person that's being arrested and he's trying to place you in handcuffs and you're trying to record him, you know, that's it's probably you may fall in line with someone who's resisting because now you're stopping them from completing that arrest. Um, if you are a passerby and you're trying to record law enforcement arresting someone else, if you do it at a distance, I'm sure there'll be no problem there. But it's the people who actually enter into that zone of arrest with their video cameras and they place them in officers' faces, you know, or behind their ears, or they get become in really close proximity to them, that may cause a lot more issues. So again, if you're if you're being arrested, that's probably not the time to break out your cell phone and start recording the officer because now you're stopping him from completing that arrest. Um, and if you're walking by because you want to record a friend or something like that being arrested, um, you may want to do it from a distance because, like I said, law enforcement doesn't know who you are or whether you know whether or not you are there to hurt them or hurt the surrounding people. So safety is going to be their ultimate goal. Well, how do we keep this scenario safe? Well, we arrest the person who's under arrest, and then we may have to take into custody or detain the person who's interfering with that arrest. So if you're going to videotape, keep it at a distance. Don't interfere with what's going on. And again, if you're going to contest an arrest, do it in the court system. Don't take it upon yourself to do it in the middle of the street. OK, uh, thank you very much for coming. Do you have any further questions for our panelists? And our panelists, can you, can you each summarize and give your, your last points of advice to our, our group of young people? Marcus, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Um, I would love for every single person to have a positive interaction with the law enforcement officer. Um, that, is probably, that will probably never happen. Every person is not going to have a positive interaction with law enforcement. But what I want everyone to remember is that um, law enforcement are, in effect, people too. People have good days, people have bad days. Uh, you would hope that an officer isn't going to allow their personal lives interfere with their job. But again, we're all people. But it's not just on them. It's also on the persons that they're interacting with. And I think that if you're being stopped by a law enforcement officer, they should, all, they should always have a clean slate. Don't assume that they're there to do something bad to you or wish you some ill will. Um, just follow the directions, be polite, you know, uh, and just really try to just to just get through it, you know? If you're gonna get a traffic citation, you're gonna get a traffic citation. If you wanna fight it, fight it at a later date. Don't fight it right there, because at the end of the day, just like I have a job, uh, we all have jobs up here. Law enforcement has a job to do. Their job is to keep everyone safe. And although you may not think getting a traffic citation is keeping everyone safe, traffic enforcement is extremely important. Without the traffic laws that we have, you know, people would be, you know, could be getting in traffic crashes all over 95 or in the community without any types of rules. So 
you just want to make sure that when you engage with law enforcement, try to make it as, as positive as you possibly can. Give them a clean slate and don't assume that they're there to do something bad to you because if you assume that, then your attitude towards them will be affected by that and it could really turn it into a turbulent situation or really bad situation. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. And you folks seem like a good, uh, smart group of, of kids. So, um, and talking to my teenagers, I tell them the same thing. When you come across an officer, whether you're trying to, whether you're getting pulled over by a marked vehicle, unmarked vehicle, pull over in a safe spot, a well lit spot. Um, you know, always keep your hands where it's visible. Have some control of your occupants in the car. Tell them to quiet it down. If somebody wants to record, which most of us are used to it by now. Uh, they can record from a distance as long as they don't start antagonizing and try to get a, a larger group around the officer where it's not going to be safe any, any longer. Um, but always, you know, again, being respectful takes you a long way. It takes you a long way with uh, law enforcement. And we, we do take a look at that. And I myself have stopped uh, kids as young as you and have ve very positive experiences and, and have instructed them, you can next time pull over where it's a little bit more well lit and, uh, you know, have your friends not blare the music, all the examples you gave is an uh, experience I recently had, but um, usually it's very positive and you, know, you, you, make up, you make of it you know, what you want it to be. Um, and don't, please don't follow what a lot of uh, social media is portraying out there. Um, you go on Facebook or Instagram or Snap and you see people videotaping officers. Well, they forget to videotape the first part where they try to start antagonizing the officer and trying to get the crowds rolling behind them, but um, you folks seem a lot smarter than that. Um, so just make it a positive experience and follow directions, see what they want. Um, a lot of times you can talk your way out of things. <laughs> I, I just want you to start by remembering that in law enforcement, when we need help, they're the people that we call. So when you encounter law enforcement based upon your traffic infraction or your driving pattern, they're not there as your enemy. They're there as your friend because they're trying to keep the road safe for you and your family. It's important to cooperate all the way through. But then you have to remember what you're right.